Good morning. Today on Spotlight, our No Holds Barred Roundtable Discussion. From Detroit, to Lansing, to Washington, to Asia. We'll tackle whatever we can over the next 30 minutes. Our guests, Richard Burr of the Detroit News, Keith Owens of the Michigan Chronicle, Tom Watkins of Dome Magazine and the China U.S. Focus Magazine, and Dave Dulio of Oakland University. It's Sunday, November the 5th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this <laughs> is Spotlight. And welcome to Spotlight and our roundtable discussion just a couple days before people have to get out and cast those votes. And I've got a, folks here that uh, know a lot about politics and business, and we'll try to thrash it all out in the next 30 minutes or so. Welcome, everybody. Good to be here. Good all right, let's start with uh, the current election, Detroit in particular, big mayor's race. Uh, everybody who thinks that Mayor Duggan is in trouble and may very well lose his seat, raise your hand and tell me why. The mayor oh, Duggan okay. is going to lose all his right. seat. <laughs> uh, no, no, I think no, the no, biggest. All the, right, the, what, what, why are you all so confident that he will win? I think really what is is what he's done. I mean, the city has come back. I mean, I, I went to graduate school at Wayne back in the, the 70s, worked there a lot. Um, the city is on a rebound, and, and it hasn't gone everywhere. It hasn't gotten uh, to every neighborhood across the city, but clearly, there's a palpable difference in the city today. Um, than before. That old saying, are you better off now than you were four years ago, yeah, applies here. I think it here. is, and, and you know, one that he said that the, uh, that, uh, the population was gonna rise. He hadn't quite reached that threshold, but he certainly has slowed down the exodus um, from mm -hmm. the city. And I think uh, the mayor has earned, Mayor Duggan has earned uh, another four years. And the biggest thing I think is, is whether or not uh, Coleman Young um, breaks that 30% threshold and, and maybe even uh, is a lot lower than that, which could be a bit embarrassing. Keith Owens, you've written uh, extensively about this and you keep saying Coleman Young Jr. has no plan. Are you still convinced? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a combination of not having a plan and also in terms of not attracting, expanding his base. His base has been, been small for a while. His base is very, his, his um, base is committed. But I think particularly if you look at the last debate, his primary job, at least I believe his job, should have been to expand that base and to convince anybody who was on the fence. Because there's still people who have questions about Doug who not necessarily, um, don't necessarily love Doug, you know, for a number mm -hmm. of reasons. But at mm -hmm. the same time, but I think he, he, after that last, when you saw his poll numbers dropped, almost nine percentage points, he wasn't able to make that pitch. And I think that's the problem, that he is not, um, I agree that Duggan has, has accomplished a lot, et cetera, but there's also some things that people have questions about, but the problem is, is that Co Coleman Young, Senator Young is not the person to make that, you know, to, to make that challenge. He has not yeah. presented himself as a credible challenger, and that's, I think that's been a big problem. When Mayor Duggan uh, got the endorsement of the black slate, was that uh, a real bad sign for Coleman oh, Young that, that Jr.? Oh, that was one of many. I'm sorry. It was. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely, <laughs> no, it was, it was a sign. I mean, it, it pretty much almost sealed the election. Now, you can never say never in politics. Sure. But, uh, but that was supposed to be endorsement that Coleman Young would get. Both in the opening and the closing statements, he said, I want to take back the motherland, which yeah. shocked everybody. But essentially what he was saying was, I don't understand why black voters in a majority black city aren't voting for me. And it was another way of saying, I don't understand why the black slate didn't go for me. And the black slate leaders said, well, we appreciate you know, what your dad did. We appreciate that you've been a decent lawmaker but Mike Duggan has brought the city back, so we feel like we can support the, him. The problem with the strategy also, I mean, because he's, he's also run ads since then, almost chastising black people who didn't vote for him. And the problem is, is that, you know, this is still, it's an 80% black city, and you're almost 40 percent behind. Okay, I mean, it's that not everybody who vote who's going. I mean, these are not a number. Obviously, there's not a number. There's a number of black people who are for Doug, and so to start call, calling you know black folks who are not for you, even calling them calling them names, that's not the smartest move. You know, <laughs> and, the and, and the the thing about Mr. Young's campaign, though, as far as I, I don't think he's really given folks in the city a reason to come out and vote for him. That's they have not. He hasn't motivated people enough, I don't think, to get out and and go to the polls on Tuesday. And, and, and as everybody knows, the, especially in an odd year election like this, turnout means everything. Who, who can get their folks to the polls is gonna win. And I don't know if, to your point, Keith, about expanding the base, I don't know if he's, I don't think he's done that enough. And, and, and the mayor has got a, a 
not a machine necessarily in place like we used to think about political machines. He, he, but, has, a, he has a machine. But he's got enough he's got enough. It's a machine with a whole lot of money behind it right now, too. Which Mr. Young does not have, right, and hasn't had the whole time. So all the advantages are in uh, in the mayor's And let's not lose sight that African Americans in the city have, have given their vote uh, to quality people, whether white or black, uh, historically. Yeah. And uh, I think have been really deserving. Mary Ann Mahaffey, uh, Mel Rabbit, David exactly. Everhart, I mean, people uh, they have a laundry their vote, list of them. Yeah. They're willing to give the vote mm -hmm. to, and that's a historical fact. Yeah. All right, yeah. All right look, hang on one second. Let me get to a little break here. We come back. I want to pick up and see what you want to say. want to talk about this Detroit city clerk race, and we're gonna go beyond. Detroit isn't the only place that has an election, so what other cities are we watching? We'll be right back, stay with us. Dave Dulio, uh, you wrote a book uh, with your colleague, uh, uh, John Klemanski over at Oakland University. What is it and why? Well, it's a book on, uh, the title says it all, Michigan Government, Politics and Policy. It's, a, uh, it's an examination of our state government, our, our politics and some key policy areas. There are, uh, full disclosure, we, we didn't write the whole thing, we edited it. Okay. Uh, it is, uh, there are chapters in there from experts around the state. And the great thing about it that we really like the way it turned out is that there are four themes that run through each and every chapter, whether it's a, a chapter on the Constitution, one about elections, one about the legislature, or even education policy, uh, the history of that particular piece of it, uh, the decline that the, that the state has faced in many, many areas over the last several decades, mm -hmm. responses to challenges that the state has tried to uh, recover from, the, from that decline, and state-local relations. So it's a good primer as we get ready to head into 2018. Absolutely. And we have a wide open gubernatorial race with no incumbency involved. Even a full chapter on Flint, too. All right, all right, that should be a We'll be talking about Flint in yeah. just a second. <laughs> uh, the Detroit City Clerk race, that's a race that, um, that everybody is really watching and seems to be maybe the hottest race that Detroiters have to vote on, besides maybe some of the marijuana stuff. I think so. Um, in the uh, primary, uh, Janice Winfrey, the uh, incumbent clerk, got 51% of the vote, and it was against a splintered field. Is she in trouble? I think she potentially is. Um, traditionally, clerks tend to win unless there's a big election mess up. She had a big mess up. A but she year said ago. she's fixed the mess up. They well, got fixed that, in the primary, and that for the three terms she's been in office, she's won by 85% of the vote, and you can't judge her on one election. True or false? Well, yes, you can. Uh, Jackie Curry learned that you could be judged on one election alone because she went from an overwhelming favorite in 2005 and within three months and an FBI investigation and a bunch of other uh, questionable practices, she was uh, replaced by someone by the name of Janice Winfrey. Garland Gilchrist uh, is a young man, uh, University of Michigan graduate, never run for political office before, but he's gotten some huge endorsement. He's gotten your paper, I believe. He's gotten the Detroit Free Press. Uh, did he get the Chronicle too? No, he didn't get the Chronicle. Didn't get the Chronicle, okay. Um, so He's raised money yeah. and he's spent it well. I mean, uh, I mean, a lot of people certainly thought Hester Wheeler was going to pull out if there was going to be yeah, somebody that was going to pull through. So, I mean, he upset one person. To be where he's at, and so I think he's within striking distance. Well, I think he's um, yeah. What he did, what he managed to do in the primary, I think, to me early on, identified that was going to be the hot race to watch. I mean, I think mm. they kind of felt like the you know the mayor's race was interesting, but I think that was pretty much unless a huge misstep happened. You think Winfrey will survive this race? It's going to be close. I mean, I, th I think that she will, but the, the last polls I saw that he said she was on like seven points ahead, and I think when you talk about somebody who had no name recognition, he's Garland Gilchrist, you know, and, and starting in the primary initially, he came in with about two. They thought it was going to be two percent. He comes in at nineteen, and then. With as much money as he's raised, he's now he's, and now he's within virtual striking. So distance. Dave, this it's gets into voter turnout. It does. Whoever can get their constituency out may very well win this election. Without a doubt, and and, and I think he's also closed pretty strong. His yes. messaging has been really good uh, in the last several weeks, and and I think that that is one. That's a race where uh, the the challenger has done enough, uh, maybe to sow some seeds of doubt and and get some folks maybe encouraged to turn out and vote for him. All right, what's going on in Lansing? Flint just cannot seem to go away. It's dogging Governor Snyder. It may very well dog him until the end of his term. Tom Watkins, you've been inside government. 
um, it's troubling. I mean, clearly, um, the people of the Flint are, are suffering, and. Uh, but who's, telling the, who's telling the truth well, here? You got at, the, at the end of the day, Harvey we, keep, we, have, to keep the focus, we have to keep the focus on the people of Flint. That's just one that is there. And the political and the um, legal process is going to play itself out. There's been some troubling, and, and as, as I speak about uh, the people of Flint, but uh, the way that this is rolling out and going after good people, I think it's hurting state government. Who wants to go uh, to state government if, if there's a mistake that's made? I don't think anybody uh, certainly set out uh, to poison the people of Flint. Well, that, that's the outcome. Um, but having run two major departments of state government, people will say to me, well, you know, didn't you read that full contract? Well, if I read every single thing, piece of paper that came in front of me, I'd be four years behind uh, with the amount of things there. there there's mistakes that have been made, and uh, I think that they're going to be addressed through both the political process and I think which will there'll be some fallout from. Uh, I think it's going to hurt the lieutenant governor uh, if, if, in fact, he gets in the race, which I assume that he, that he will. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have legal repercussions because Nick Lyon, uh, the, the Department of Health and Human Services, is facing two felonies uh, uh, right now, and that's pretty daunting. Uh, yep. to get up and go to work every day. Uh, so, any other thoughts about this uh, this timeline that seems well, I to think, be in question? I think what you're seeing is you're seeing the special prosecutor has been bringing, uh, bringing stuff out from Harvey Hollins, and it's been having a ripple effect where you've got Democrats back in Congress want to reopen the Flint investigation. There's a question as to whether the House Oversight Committee will or not. You think they'll call Snyder back up to Washington or uh, enough Republicans there to, 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 to put that, that wall and say, nope, he's not coming I back would, up here? I would tend to doubt it, but I think it depends on what other facts come out. I mean, the question is, what did Harvey Hollins exactly tell Snyder on that conference call mm -hmm. on December 24th? And, uh, and you know, is it enough to expect whatever was told to him that he'd realize that that's a true public health emergency? Whereas when his chief of staff, Dennis Muchmore, about three weeks later heard about it, the first thing he did once he, he heard about it was he said, holy crap, and immediately scheduled a press conference. And as somebody was pointing out to me, that's the difference between having somebody like Dennis much more who's been in state government for a long time who would realize that was a big so problem. So you're saying that's the difference between a lot of political experience in government and a CEO of business coming in, first termer, um, not realizing when someone says something about experience, this, then all of a sudden you're saying, oh, oh, that's a red yeah. flag. I think, well, experience also when you pull, I think when you look at the whole issue, when you pull back, I mean, there's so, many, there's so much going on, but when you really pull back and go to the very beginning when this started, and now this is going to be the issue that, that defines, you know, Snyder's, you know, uh, time in office. And that's, I think that's what really we're looking at is that this is something that the, the, the decisions were, that were made and what was behind those decisions the fact, and the people that pay the price, the people in Flint, there's no way around that in terms of the pain that they've experienced and suffered and how that was, and that's what really we're left with at the end is that how in the world could this have happened? And Dave Dula, this could be bigger at the end of all of this, this could be bigger on his resume than the bankruptcy, than the resurgence of Detroit. Um, Grand Rapids, other urban areas uh, doing very well under his term. I don't think there's any doubt that, that it, it, it will be what is, it, that it will outweigh those other accomplishments. Right. And that's a shame for the governor, but it's, anytime this story comes back up, it's a reminder for us, for all of us, that this is going to be with us, with our state, for not just a couple of years, until the governor's out, but much That's longer long, than that, long, decades yeah. down the road. And I think right. we have to get some right. recognition. Hang, hang on one second there, tell him my ear, I gotta get to a break. We'll hurry right back and stay with us. Okay, Tom, I cut you off this last time. And I yeah, I mean, the point that I want to make is clearly there was mistakes made at Flint and people are suffering. But the governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor Nick Lyon, their team are committed to try to fix it right now. And, and I think we can't lose sight of that. Uh, this is going to be a legacy, uh, but they're working hard to try to do what they can uh, to repair the damage up in Flint. Okay, uh, let's move on up the road to Washington, D.C. Uh, what isn't going on in Washington, D.C.? Um, we got this Mueller investigation, indictment came down, got a guilty plea already. Is that, how much is that going to overshadow what 
President Trump wants to get done in the halls of Congress, particularly his tax plan? Well, I think, you know, it'll always be a shadow hanging over him. And obviously, he's a pretty sensitive guy because he's always tweeting about you this think? stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> you so, think? Yeah, I know. Kind of so, kind of <laughs> but, but the Republicans know if they don't get some kind of a tax package through, their chances of getting reelected in 2018 are not very good. And it's Trump's biggest priority. And tax reform is always very difficult because even though you're cutting rates for people and trying to put more uh, money in your pockets, they also have to try to get rid of certain deductions and those certain reductions have their constituencies, whether it's uh, the state uh, and local income tax, um, stuff like that, that. There are people from different uh, states that rely on those. And so it's like anything, it'll be difficult, but they, they have to concentrate on that. But, but Dave Dulio, can you stay focused on those things when you've got so much other stuff going on, investigations all around you? Uh, Kelly said the other day, that this is a distraction. For the White House, it is without a doubt. I think you've got, you've got Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell in the House and Senate, respectively, ho though, who are focused on this. And, and they're not as drawn into the Mueller investigation as the White House is, obviously. And, and I think they know that time is running out for them. As Richard said, right, Republicans have been promising this as they've promised other things for a long time. And they know they need to start to deliver. They couldn't do it on a repeal of Obamacare. Uh, and they, they know that I think they have to get this done before we hit calendar year 2018 and we start to turn into campaign mode. All right, uh, they're getting ready, the president is getting ready to go to China into Asia. We're going to talk about that in just a second from a man who has spent a lot of time there. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Okay, uh, the president is getting ready to go to China, Asia. Uh, we've got North Korea. Uh, watching all of this very closely, all this tension back and forth. Uh, Tom, this is a very important trip. It is. I mean, look, uh, the relationship between the U.S. and China is the most important bilateral relationship in the world today. Every major world issue is going to intersect at the corner of Washington, D.C. and Beijing. So maintaining uh, good, friendly relationships with China while addressing some real issues. And I think the two focuses that they're gonna be in this upcoming meeting, and it's Trump's first visit to China as President of the United States, is gonna be about trade and North Korea uh, and how they address those issues. And I'm hoping that there isn't a wag the dog moment uh, while the President's over and try to distract. Uh, this is a very serious issue um, and dealing uh, with the leader of North Korea um, better be very serious and very thoughtful on how that issue is handled. What is it that China wants? What is it that we want? What is it North Korea wants? Uh, you know, if you talked uh, not too long ago, uh, former Mexican President Vicente Fox was in town. Uh, he said the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico is terrible right now. The U.S. can't be trusted. Uh, they don't know what to think about this. They've moved closer in trade to places like China as a result of it because they feel like they can't trust us. Um, we're hearing, uh, if you talk to the Trump administration, they feel we've got a wonderful relationship. Well, what's, what's the real truth of what's going on here? Well, I think um, a lot of countries are a little uneasy um, depending on what their particular issue is. I mean, when Trump says, I want to get rid of NAFTA and we're going to renegotiate it, of course, Mexico is going to be uneasy about it. Mm -hmm. China, in the case of China, um, I think it's clear that Trump- But he's also sent signals on TPP. Um, <laughs> right. He doesn't like that. Well, a lot of these other countries are saying, well, you know what? <laughs> let, let, let's, de let's deal with China and some of these other places now. Well, I mean, from a trade standpoint, you are going to lose trade if you keep threatening to disrupt deals. Now, he thinks he's gonna negotiate better deals. We'll have to wait and see on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, in the case of China, he's been a li slightly more thoughtful, only in the sense that he's held back on doing some of the things he wanted to do on cracking down on China on currency manipulation and stuff. And he's been doing that because he's been trying to give China 
the Chinese leaders an opportunity to try to rein in North Korea, which hasn't really had any results. And I think that's one of the reasons why this is such a big meeting for Trump, because he's going to go in there and say, you know, North Korea is still ramping up its nuclear program. I'm not seeing anything appreciable uh, out of, out of uh, the Chinese who, prov uh, who prov uh, provide 90% of the financing and trade with North Korea, so they have a huge influence. Well, getting back to uh, the, the president is that he's perceived as weak now, you know, in other words, and, and the, that's causing a major problem because when, you, when you're dealing with the president, you don't know what's going to happen with the domestic issues overshadowing every, as much of his administration as they are now. They don't know what they're dealing with. So for him to be, you know, what does his hand, what, what kind of a hand does he have coming in? And that's, I think that's what's causing the biggest problem. That's why in terms of the, from the Western countries, that's why everyone's looking at now, you know, Angela Merkel's almost taking the role that the U.S. has used to have because Donald Trump is not only untrustworthy, but his hand is weak. We are undoubtedly in a unique time here in American politics, and that would carry over to foreign policy as well, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the factors of many that make it unique is, is uh, President Trump promised a, a bit of unpredictability. And, and we're seeing he's that. And he's, he's delivered. He's delivered. That is on one that. thing that he's yeah. that he is he's delivered on, right? Is is being unpredictable. So to look far down to the down the line in, in a lot of this stuff, I think is uh, is tough to do, and maybe even unwise because we don't know what his next move is going to be. He's not predictable in in almost any way, except that he's going to tweet at some ridiculous hour of the of the night. And Keith is, is right on on it because the president is weak and, the, and China's president Xi Jinping has never been stronger. Mm. Um, he just finished up his uh, five-year Congress, uh, enshrined himself in the Chinese constitution. Uh, so the Chinese <laughs> president is uh, at a strongest point going back to Mao's time. Uh, when our president is having some domestic issues that are trailing him right now. So it's going to be a, a tough road, I think, to get these negotiations, which the world is depending on getting right. Richard, I'm going to give you a last quick word on this. Uh, another hot spot over here is Spain. What in the world is going on? Well, uh, it's like anything. You, uh, once uh, these countries get in the news, you start realizing there's places like uh, Catalonia where there's uh, been an independence movement for quite a long time and uh, it results in different events sparking up and you know you just never know when uh, you know when this kind of stuff is going to rear its head or for that matter you know the terror incident in New York City. I mean everybody was worrying about a copycat incident happening with someone not using a gun but using an actual vehicle to, to kill wolves. people. Yeah all right if there's one thing we can say for sure we're living in interesting times. Thanks for joining us today on Spotlight. And we want to thank you at home for joining us. I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the Spotlight. We hope you have a great week.